In evolution, one of the major uh, concepts is what is a species? And a species is a group of organisms that are reproductively isolated from each other. Now, what does that mean? Well, reproductive isolation depends on various mechanisms that keep one species from being able to successfully mate with other species. Now, these fall into two categories, these reproductive isolating mechanisms. They're prezygotic reproductive isolating mechanisms, the ones that prevent the zygote from happening, the fertilization of the egg by sperm, as compared to the postzygotic reproductive isolating mechanisms. So those are, okay, we've got the sperm to the egg. This is what prevents the formation of a fertile, viable, hybrid offspring. And just in case I didn't say it before, a hybrid is a cross between two different species. Now, prezygotic reproductive isolating mechanisms fall into several different categories. There's habitat isolation. If the two species live in different locations and their habitats never coincide, that will keep them isolated. This is one of the reasons why we consider lions and tigers to be two separate species, even though some of you that have paid attention to some of the freakier parts of your textbook may have seen pictures of ligers or tiglons. If you have a really artificial situation, you have a zoo, and somebody happened to keep the tigers and lions in the same cage or in close enough cages, sometimes in that weirdly different situation, you can wind up with tigers and lions successfully mating with each other and producing this tiglon or liger. Mating seasons, or sometimes they'll call it temporal isolation. If your mating season is, say, the spring, then you will mate with your species during the spring. You will not mate with a species whose mating season is, say, the fall. You walk up to them and say, you want to mate? No, they don't. They're completely disinterested. Meanwhile, fall comes around, they come up to you, you want to mate? No, not the time for it. So that's another way of keeping two perhaps closely related species separate from each other. Mechanical isolation, and I put that in quotes, um, and I'll put some other things into quotes. This is when the mechanics prevent it. Uh, essentially, when the male key doesn't fit the female's lock. And if you want to do some interesting reading, go on to the internet and see if you can find out about some of the different shapes of the keys. And uh, try to imagine in your head, how do they manage to get that into the lock? But basically, that's what's going on there. Then there's gamete isolation. That's when the gametes are incompatible with each other, where the sperm, even if it somehow manages to get its way to the egg, it doesn't have the right enzymes or receptor proteins to be able to uh, effectively work in its way into the egg. Now there's one more that I forgot to put up, and that's behavioral. And this is perhaps one of my favorite ones to talk about. Behavioral isolation involves things like courtship rituals. If you want to see behavioral isolation in action, go to a high school prom. Watch the dance. A lot of the behaviors that you see the kids going on there are actually part of the behavioral isolation that keeps the human species separate from other species. If a spider came up to you and started wiggling its front legs at you, you're very unlikely to go hubba hubba. But it's trying to show off its courtship rituals that to another spider may be very alluring, but to you, ugh, spider. On the other hand, if you walk up to a spider and say, hey, how you doing? It's going to scuttle away. I'm afraid you're going to slap it because you're using the wrong courtship rituals. Now, behavioral isolation, these rituals, these ways that we engage in mating behaviors, a lot of times they actually have more than just, hey, let's make sure that you're the right species. They often will demonstrate how wonderful you are, what kind of combination of genes that you have, and how impressive they are, and don't you want to share them in the next generation with me? For example, there's this little kind of bird, and what happens is that in the morning, when it's the right mating season, the female birds will all line up and they'll watch and the males will come out. Now the males have these what's called a comb. That's if you've ever seen an old uh, cartoon with roosters like rooster uh, foghorn leghorn. The comb is that red floppy thing that's on the head of the male bird. Well the males will inflate it with blood and then they'll do a little dance. And the male who's got the nicest dance and the 
biggest comb will get the attraction of all the females. What's interesting is that the females, if one of them goes forward and the other ones don't, she'll quickly scuttle back. But if a whole bunch of them go forward, then all of a sudden that one male is sitting there going, whoa, and lots of females are approaching him. And if you doubt that humans are affected by this, have you ever watched the Flavor of Love or Rock of Love? Why are all those women so interested in being with the bachelor of the week who's on one of those dating shows? Now, scientists would watch this and they wonder what's going on there. And they tested to see what it was that was happening. And what they did is they took a rubber glove, a red rubber glove. Now, these birds are about maybe this big. They took a red rubber glove, cut off the fingers, stuffed them with something, and they put it on the head of a male who had a small little comb. He walked out barely able to stand, but he started wobbling around with this gigantic comb, and all the females went boom and almost killed him. Well, after they did some investigation, they found out that that particular bird the, um, has a parasite, these worms that can get into the blood vessels of the comb, and it's most active at dawn. And so by inflating their combs, if they can inflate their comb very high, that tells the females, look at my immune system, ladies. Look how effectively it's protecting me. Whereas if you're infested with worms and you try to inflate your combs, like, eh, eh, and the females are not interested. So behavioral isolation doesn't just help keep us reproductively isolated. It's ways of us demonstrating our awesome genes. Look at again at the high school prom, the dance. What does dancing demonstrate? Look at my skills. My nervous system can coordinate with my muscle system very well. Postzygotic. Finally, you've somehow managed to get the egg and sperm together of two different species, but what prevents that from developing? Well, a lot of times you wind up creating a hybrid of those two species that is simply not viable, whether it dies even before being, bro uh, being born or maybe it's weak and unable to survive long on its own, not very competitive. A lot of times you wind up, even if it is viable, it survives, it winds up being sterile. A good example of this is a mule. If you take a donkey and a horse and you cross them, you'll get a progeny, you'll get an offspring of it. It's called the mule. And mules are great animals. That's why during uh, the prospecting era here in California, the stereotype was the 49er bringing along his uh, materials packed up on his mule. Mules are very strong, great animals, but they're sterile because they are this hybrid. So donkeys and horses are two separate species because of this hybrid sterility. A last one that's a little bit unusual is this concept called hybrid breakdown. And that's where, okay, the first generation of the hybrid, maybe it can survive and maybe it can compete. Maybe it can even have some offspring. But the next generation after that, the children of the children and the grandchildren and so on, they start having greater and greater problems. And typically these sorts of things are due to mismatches in the chromosomes of the two separate species parents. And there you go. Those are the reproductive isolating mechanisms.